If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Have you ever looked at a Book of Mormon and you see the, the white Jesus on the inside cover of a Book of Mormon or you look at a lot of Seventh-day Adventist uh, works, they have the, the white uh, Norwegian Jesus with the hairdresser hair hairdo and uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. In fact, uh, one of my videos where we went to San Antonio uh, at the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Worldwide Convention, in fact, there's a lot of people speaking foreign languages was when uh, uh, Dan and me were over there. Uh, but they had pictures all over the place of Jesus, right? And uh, all of them were this white guy <laughs> that, that would look like, uh, well, he was kind of a long hair uh, dude So uh, in the pictures they had, so you or me would qualify it being exactly like him. And uh, most times he had a beard and stuff. But, uh, but you, know, you know the kind of pictures that people put out. I'd like to interject right here concerning this painting that I had to look at as a small child to get some kind of healing done or whatever from staring at this painting. Here's a little background information about it from Wikipedia. Anyone can access on the internet. But this painting was done by Warner Salman, born April 30th, 1892 to May 25th, 1968. He was an American painter from Chicago, best known for his works of Christian religious imagery. He worked in commercial advertising as well as a freelance illustrator. He's most associated with his portrait of Jesus called Head of Christ, of which more than 500 million copies have been sold. In 1994, the New York Times wrote, that he is likely to be voted the, quote, best known artist of the century, end quote, mainly because of this Head of Christ painting that he did. Now, he came from, as you can see here on the Wikipedia information, down here in the biography section, says Salman was a lifelong member of the Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant of America, which was later renamed the Evangelical Covenant Church, an evangelical Protestant denomination. And of course, he came up with this painting, which was designed in 1940. And since then, it just joins a whole menagerie of other paintings and icons of Christ throughout the centuries, of which people use for just pure idolatry in many cases. They pray to those paintings or icons, bow down to them, and all these types of things. What I find interesting also is the fact that there's a relationship here with the cults. Many of the cults you find, particularly American cults, have a, a love for images of a white Jesus, even though he came from you know the Middle East and Israel where that's located. They like to think of him as an American like them, I guess, in, in appearance. Along these lines, here's a clip from one of our videos that has over 400,000 views at the moment, at the time of this recording, called Ellen White's Seventh-day Adventism Qualifies as a Pseudo-Christian Antichrist American Cult. Now, that's a long title, but I generally make long titles for a lot of our videos because it hits the search engines more often, so you get more views in a lot of cases. So that's why the one reason the title's so long, but it also explains a lot at the same time. And here's what we said in this video. But I did bring with me, I don't know if you can see it on the screen here. Yeah, we is, can. Uh, here's, here's in Seventh-day Adventism. If people go to that video I mentioned already, that's our number one most watched video over the last 28 days of the Seventh-day Convention. But this is what the Mormon 
or this is what the Seventh Day Adventist Jesus looks like. You can see that. Uh, and they had here's another depiction of them. But over and over again, they got many. If you do an internet search, a Google search, a Yahoo search on images of Jesus and Seventh Day Adventism, you're going to find a multitude, and they all pretty much look like this white guy that was a hippie during the 70s. Uh, and, uh, Talk about an anachronism. Yes. <laughs> and then, but if you go to Mormonism and do an internet search on images of Jesus and Mormonism, you're going to find that they're, they're Mormon Jesus. And here's a couple of shots of it. Looks an awful lot the same yeah. as the Seventh Day Adventist Jesus, and uh, you start to see these similarities. And when I was at that that Seventh Day Adventist conference, and uh, the, the 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 images of Jesus were just like these samples I just showed you, all over the place. I mean, it's just this white 1970s hippie guy from America, uh, and <laughs> I was sitting there walking around, man, that's just like Joseph Smith's Jesus. That's just like Mormon. How did this happen? Now, you just saw that. Now, I have a comment that's down in the comment section. If you go to that on any of my YouTube videos on Seventh-day Adventism, if you look down and look for the CE Answers TV comments, you'll see that I have a comment that starts with, was Jesus a white man as Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists depict in their books, artwork, tracts, pamphlets, and numerous outreaches? Many people ask the question, why did God make Jesus white when the majority of peoples in the world are non-white? Ellen G. White, the prophetess of Seventh-day Adventism, certainly taught that Jesus was a white man. See Ellen White's inspired bigotry, racism, and discrimination at the following link, www cultorchristian.com slash egwbigotry.html. The following is just a few quotes from the Seventh-day Adventist prophet from the above link. Quote, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. You are the children of God. He has adopted you. And he desires you to form characters here that will give you entrance into the heavenly family. Remembering this, you will be able to bear the trials which you meet here. In heaven, there will be no color line, for all will be as white as Christ himself. Let us thank God that we can be members of the royal family. End quote. And your reference there is the Gospel Herald, March 1st, 1901. Quote, trust in God, quote, paragraph 20 from a, quote, talk given by Mrs. E.G. White to the church for the colored in Vicksburg, Sabbath day, March 16th, 1901. So she's apparently preaching to, as it mentions here, uh, colored people, you know, African Americans, and gave this message. And then here's another quote, quote, but there is an objection to the marriage of the white race with the black. All should consider that they have no right to entail upon their offspring that which will place them at a disadvantage. They have no right to give them as a birthright a condition which would subject them to a life of humiliation. The children of these mixed marriages have a feeling of bitterness toward the parents who have given them this lifelong inheritance. For this reason, if there were no other, there should be no intermarriage between the white and the colored race. That's from Manuscript 7, 1896, coming from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 343, paragraph 2, page 344, paragraph 0. Here's another quote. Quote, in reply to inquiries regarding the advisability of intermarriage between Christian young people of the white and black races, I would say in my earlier experience, this question was brought before me and the light given me of the Lord was that this step should not be taken for it is sure to create controversy and confusion. I have always had the same counsel to give. No encouragement to marriages of this character should be given among our people. Let the colored brother enter into marriage with a colored sister who is worthy 
one who loves God and keeps his commandments. Let the white sister who contemplates uniting in marriage with the colored brother refuse to take the step, for the Lord is not leading in this direction. Quote, time is too precious to be lost in controversy that will arise over this matter. Let not questions of this kind be permitted to call our ministers from their work. The taking of such a step will create confusion and hindrance. It will not be for the advancement of the work or for the glory of God. Letter 36, 1912. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 344, paragraphs 1 and 2. All right, continuing on to the next page. What does the Bible say to those who would denounce interracial marriage like Ellen White did? Quote, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous, end quote. That's from the Bible, Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 and verses 9 through 10. Quote, I have already written that the colored people should not urge that they be placed on an equality with white people. It's coming from letter 202, 1903, page 2, in parenthesis to J.E. White and wife, September 11th, 1903, end quote. That's from Manuscript Releases, volume 4, page 23, paragraph 2. Quote, many whom God would use as his instruments have been disqualified at their birth by the previous wrong habits of their parents, end quote. That's from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 2, page 1005. Quote, the colored people should not urge that they be placed on an equality with white people. The relation of the two races have been a matter hard to deal with, and I fear that it will ever remain a most perplexing problem. Quote, I know that if we attempt to meet the ideas and preferences of some of the colored people, we shall find our way blocked completely. The work of proclaiming the truth for this time is not to be hindered by an effort to adjust the position of the Negro race. Should we attempt to do this, we should find that barriers like mountains would be raised to hinder the work that God desires to have done. If we move quietly and judiciously, laboring in the way that God has marked out, both white and colored people will be benefited by our labors, end quote. This is coming from Testimonies of the Church, volume 9, page 214, paragraph 3, page 215, paragraph 0. Quote, every species of animal which God had created were preserved in the ark. The confused species which God did not create, which were the result of amalgamation were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there have been amalgamation of man and beast, as may be seen in almost endless varieties of species of animals and in certain races of men, end quote. That's coming from the Seventh-day Adventist Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 75, paragraph 2. To see our field trip, to the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference in San Antonio, Texas, where 70,000 Seventh-day Adventists from around the world gathered to exalt Ellen G. White and their depiction of Jesus as some sort of Norwegian white man, just like the Mormons do, despite what Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2 says. The proof of this is in our video called Seventh-day Adventists glorify Ellen G. White and a white Jesus in San Antonio SDA Conference. 
Of course, that was held in 2015. At the following link, www.youtube.com slash watch question mark V equals D1F capital U N U R W W M 8. God's position on images from the Old Testament. Nearly everyone familiar with the Bible should be familiar with this passage of the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. It's coming from the New King James Version throughout, unless otherwise noted. And then underneath here, we have a quote from the Roman Catholic Douay Rheims version of their Bible. But I'm not going to read all that here. We got the main context from Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 through 5, but you can freeze frame it and read their version of it. In other words, God is saying that one of the reasons he did not want to be seen was that he felt the people might think that they should make any idol or icon. Notice that he also said no image of any male or female. See also Isaiah 44, 9. Quote, those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. End quote. This prohibition against idols was not limited to idols of foreign gods. God is also quite displeased with images that are supposed to direct worship to him, as this passage from Exodus chapter 32, verses 7 and 8 shows. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. End quote. The Bible shows that God did not want his people to bow down before images that humans made. Quote, You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar, shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. That's coming from Leviticus chapter 26, verse 1. The children of Israel were apparently not even allowed the possession of icons, as Joshua 7, 13 seems to show. Quote, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. End quote. Thus, all forms of idols and icons were prohibited by God in the Old Testament. Also, notice that God says those with idols are like idols in that they have eyes, but they do not see, and ears, but they do not hear. Quote, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Psalm 135, verses 15 through 18. Furthermore, notice that in the future, God will get rid of all idols. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Thus says the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols and cause the images to cease. Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 13. God's position on idols is shown in the New Testament. Idols were discussed by many New Testament writers. Jesus taught, but I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam to eat things sacrificed to idols. Revelation chapter 2 verse 14. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow my servants to eat things sacrificed to idols. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20. Jesus also taught God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit 
and truth. John 4, 24, which of course wouldn't include icons or images. And the truth is that God does not want to be represented by things made by man. And the truth is that since no one knows what Jesus, or God the Father for that matter, looks like, all iconic representations of God are not spirit and are not true. This is part of why all idols and icons are wrong. Notice something from the book of Acts, verse 28 in Acts 17 and starting. For we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Being therefore the offspring of God, we must not suppose the divinity to be like unto gold or silver or stone, the graving of art and device of man. And God indeed, having winked at the times of this ignorance, now declareth unto men that all should everywhere do penance. Acts 17, 29 through 30 from the Douay Reims. Now, keep in mind the Douay Reims is a Roman Catholic version of the Bible. Yes, I show the Roman Catholic Douay Reims version of the Bible as a interesting contrast in how even the Roman Catholics themselves are hypocritical and don't follow their own translation. Even in this translation here, there's a perversion of the text where they say do penance, but that's not correct. That's been added to the Bible. Thus they've cursed themselves under the condemnation found in Revelation 22 about adding to the word of God. It shouldn't be penance. It should be repentance. But anyway, this is all just to show that even in a Roman Catholic translation of the Bible, they violate their own scriptures with all their statues, their carvings, their candles, their paintings, and all the rest of it that they do in their idolatry. And of course, in Eastern Orthodoxy, with all their icons, it ends up being the same thing. The following verses concern Paul and his writings on this subject. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, shall not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands. That can include statues, icons, and graven images and so forth. As though he needed anything. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. That's from Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. And now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is an idolater. 1 Corinthians 5, 11. Neither idolaters will inherit the kingdom of God. That's an abbreviated section there from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 and 14. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? 2 Corinthians 6, 16. Now the works of the flesh are evident idolatry. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 and 20. For this you know that no idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5. Therefore put to death covetousness which is idolatry. Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what you're supposed to do. 1 Thessalonians 1 9. Paul is clear, true Christians do not have idols. There are to be none in a church. Idolatry is a work of the flesh, and Christians are to turn from idols to God. Statues, like the Roman Catholic statues, all their pictures of Mary and all the rest of it that they, they do, the, the icons of Mary that the Eastern Orthodox do, and the rest of these graven images and so forth, that's just pure idolatry. That's all it is. 
And these idolaters that worship these things or venerate them, as they say, that's just their excuse to get away with their idolatry. That's basically the bottom line. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.